right, good morning. My name is Wade Wegner, and I'm the technical evangelist for Windows Azure. And today I'm going to give you a tour of the Windows Azure platform. And usually I like to start off with a quick show of hands. I'm curious, how many people here have built a Windows Azure application and deployed it? Can you raise your hands? All right, I see maybe three hands up, four hands. All right, well, good. That, that lets me know what to uh, cover. So we're going we're gonna to tour around the Windows Azure platform, um, covering a lot of the different services. And I'm also going to talk about uh, some of the newer services uh, that, have, um, that have been, we've, been, we've been adding to the platform, some of the updates and features. So in terms of the objectives, one of the first things I wanted to do is focus on the core services that uh, make up the Windows Azure platform and uh, give some background. And I think given the um, experience the audience here has, I think that'll be a, that'll be a good thing to do. And then I'm going to go through some of the enhancements and new features that we've introduced over the last six months. And throughout the entire presentation, I'm going to jump over to demos and use the demos as a way to reinforce uh, some of the concepts. And I'm going to take that demo from a file new project um, all the way over to an application that is running up in Windows Azure and leveraging these services. So hopefully it's a, it's a nice uh, introduction to the platform and something that you can use to uh, provide a basis for the rest of the uh, rest of the event. And so the Windows Azure platform, um, here's a, a sentence that tries to identify what it is that we're doing with Windows, with Windows Azure. The first is to really note that it's a platform as a service model. And what this means is that rather than worrying about or being concerned with underlying hardware, or even the operating system, you just focus on your application. And so you build your application, and you deploy your application to the Windows Azure. It's, it's as simple as that. Now, there's certainly some nuances uh, to it, but really, you're just focused on building your application. The second thing to be aware of is that um, it's also designed for uh, scale, so highly elastic and being able to build elastic applications that you can scale from, from very small numbers based on uh, your needs to a great many number of uh, instances and, and scale to a lot of, uh, uh, just, just scale up the capacity to meet the demands of your system. And then the third thing to point out about platforms as a service is that it's also a pay-as-you-go model. So you only pay for the resources that you use and consume. Um, Open and flexible is a principle that goes back to when we first started building the platform three years ago. And uh, you know, you might, um, you're, you're probably aware that with Windows Azure, it's a great place to run .NET and ASP.NET applications, but it's also a really good place to run other frameworks and, and technologies as well. So you can run PHP or Python um, or Java on the platform. And the important thing to consider is that with Windows Azure, you can bring your own runtime to the platform, um, just as you can with Windows Server. So uh, with PHP, you can install PHP onto the machine. You can use fast CGI with IIS, and it's a great place to run PHP applications. Uh, with with uh, Java, you can bring the Java runtime along with your application and do something as, uh, just like a uh, run Tomcat and uh, run, run Java within Tomcat. So it's an open and flexible platform that you can use and bring your own runtime with you. Also, if you're, if you're currently building uh, against the Microsoft stack, you'll find that the platform is familiar uh, with the uh, ways in which you've built applications already. So in terms of leveraging existing investments, I mean not only investments such as Visual Studio and .NET and the technologies you're familiar with, but also the, um, the, the uh, experiences and the skills that you have building these applications apply to this platform as well. And so one of, the, one of these core principles here is, is leveraging these existing investments. And then finally is uh, to start thinking about the Windows Azure platform as a great place for next generational applications. And what I mean by this is um, mobile applications or social gaming applications, applications that you may not know what the, uh, the resources you need for it are or, or you know, where your end user may be. These are great places. Uh, the Windows Azure, uh, Windows Azure platform 
is a, is a great place to run these applications. Now there's a set of core services that are fundamental for understanding the Windows Azure platform, and I've enumerated them here. Uh, the first is compute. And so compute is really just the raw processing of your applications and the running of your applications within the, within the platform. I mentioned that within Windows Azure, we provide uh, a runtime for .NET and for IIS, but you can also bring your own runtime with you and then run other, other technologies as well. Um, one thing I'd point out is, uh, let's say, two, two weeks ago at Mix, uh, Steve Marks, who's the tactical strategist for Windows Azure, gave a great talk in which all he did was build uh, PHP, uh, Ruby, Python uh, applications running in Windows Azure, also leveraging Node.js. So it's a great, a great talk. It's available online, highlighting uh, the Windows Azure platform as a place to run non.NET uh, technologies. The other thing that's important to understand about compute is this concept of automated service management. And what that means is that since you're just building your application and, build and bringing your application to the platform, the platform itself is responsible for patching the OS or scaling up and, and starting additional instances. So as you need to grow and as your application needs to scale, it's managed for you. you. You tell us what you want to scale to, and the Windows Azure platform is able to scale. So that auto automated service management piece is very important. Storage is a, is a service that runs within the Windows Azure platform, and it's a highly scalable and available storage service. And when I say highly scalable, it's important to understand that um, you need to have a storage service that scales just as well as your compute layer does as well. And so some of the concepts that are part of the storage service allows you to scale out that storage, um, all your storage, things like um, structured data or images or videos um, can be scaled out elastically on this platform. And when I say highly available, what I mean is that um, it's, it can handle, uh, handle issues with hardware failure or other things that may, may happen in the platform. So within Windows Azure Storage, we always keep three copies of all the data available so that it's a highly available service. You won't lose data within it. Now, there's a num number of uh, storage constructs that are part of the Windows Azure Storage Services. Uh, blobs is, is the first. So a blob is, is a binary data, something that uh, you can, you can you upload into the platform, uh, typically represented by images or video. And um, the, the blobs are a great place to, to put this type of data so that it can scale with the storage service. We also have tables, so the Windows Azure table service. And this is a place for structured data that you need to scale to uh, a great extent. Um, one of the things to note about it is that it's very much of a NoSQL storage system. So it's not a relational database. It's not a relational table, as you might know from SQL Server. And so one of the important things to, to realize with the storage service is that you partition your data up front. So when you define your model for your data, you'll partition it, and that allows the storage service to scale that data elastically as needed. Uh, queues, we also have queues within the storage service. The queue is a, is, a, is a storage construct that makes it easy to abstract uh, different types of workloads and to scale your resources independently. So for instance, if you have an application that, let's say, needs to do video encoding, you can have a web application and your, your video encoder solution that are running in two sets of instances that are communicating through queues. So as you need to, to start doing some type of work, you would enqueue that work item into a queue, and then the worker role can be monitoring that queue and process things as needed. The last thing listed here is drives. And what drives is, is it's, it's a way of uh, mounting the storage service as an NTFS partition within, within your Windows Azure instance. So if you have a legacy application or some kind of application that needs to read data off of disk, uh, you can use a Windows Azure drive as a way of storing your data durably within the Windows Azure storage service, but interacting with it as if it's a drive. Um, so those are the four different types of storage constructs. One thing that's uh, key and kind of important to realize is that um, all of these, except for the drives, are available via REST, REST APIs. 
And so you've got blobs, tables, and queues that you interact with via these REST APIs, which means that it supports both code near and code far scenarios. A code near scenario is where your application is deployed into Windows Azure, and it's communicating with Windows Azure storage services. Code far is where my application may be on premises or in a hosting environment, but not within Windows Azure. Since I can interact with the storage services via these REST APIs, um, I can still use you know, Windows Azure blobs or tables um, as part of my applications. Um, so that, that one other aspect of it is, is since it's a REST API that you communicate over uh, HTTP and HTTPS, it's also interoperable to other platforms. So any technology or framework that's able to uh, talk HTTP or HTTPS is able to interact with the storage service. Now the last uh, one of the core services that I've listed here is database. And database is, a, is well, it's called SQL Azure, and it's a relational database that's available as a service. So if you're familiar with SQL Server, you're familiar with SQL Azure. It's the exact same concept. Um, you can create databases uh, that have things like triggers, stored procedures, uh, user-defined functions, and so forth. And so uh, the relational database allows you to um, store your data in a relational data uh, store, interact with it like you would in most of your applications, but it's managed for you as a service. So you're not responsible for creating the database, you're not responsible for managing the database, or even responsible for uh, dealing with performance and scalability. It's all part of the managed service um, that you can tap into. Now, what's interesting about SQL Azure is um, you don't have to change your applications in order to work with it. So, for instance, if you're using ADO.NET to interact with SQL Server today, you can still use the same APIs, the same runtime to interact with SQL Azure. All that changes is that your connection string will now point to the SQL Azure database instead of your local SQL Server database. And uh, I'll show you this in a, in a moment. And so with that, what I want to do is start with the first demo, and I want to start with a file new project and demonstrate um, the compute aspect of the platform, uh, the, the database, so use SQL Azure, and then also show you the Windows Azure storage service and leverage some of the capabilities there. So let's flip over to that. And so I'm going to start with a file new project. And Given the theme of the keynote and the discussion of things like ASP.NET MVC, um, I'm going to go ahead and create a brand new uh, ASP.NET MVC 3 application, you, uh, leveraging the uh, Razor syntax and also HTML5 semantic markup. And so create a brand new application. And one of the things that I wanted to show is a, um, a code-first way of using Entity Framework 4.1 to build a SQL Azure database. I think this is a pretty, pretty neat way to go about doing it, and uh, um, it's also pretty, pretty straightforward. So I've got a brand new application. The first thing I need to do is define my model. And so I'm going to create a very simple Northwind type database and do this by uh, creating, oops, let me do that again, uh, create a new class, and we're going to call it the Northwind model. Now, within the Northwind model, we're going to have products, and we're also going to have categories. Now, rather than build the whole model, just have a couple of snippets to get the model out. And let me show you what I've got here. So I've got a product class, and I've got a category class. This is plain old CLR objects. Um, you can see that I've defined uh, properties such as product ID, product name, unit, et cetera. And one of the important pieces here is that I've defined a relationship between my products and my categories. So the way I've defined this here is that every product has at least, or has at most, one category associated to it. So when I create a product, I can assign a category to it. And so you can see that relationship here where I've got a category ID of type category, and then I've got uh, a collection of products here in the category. And so the Entity Framework 4.1, when it, when it uses this, uh, this, these uh, objects to generate the database, it can understand the relationship and then generate my database accordingly. Now, there's also some ways to, uh, to attach some attributes to define different types of uh, uh, you know, different types of things within my database. So for instance, if I want to make my product name requ required, 
I can use this data annotation to mark it required. And so then when my database is generated, product name would be a required uh, uh, object within the, within the table. And then similarly, I can do that with a category name. All right. So go ahead and, and build that. So I've defined my model. Now I can create some controllers that I'll, I'll use to uh, interact with it. So we'll create a product controller. And we're going to use the model product. And then I'm going to create a new data context of type Northwind context. And we'll add that. One of the things that's really nice with this, this model and approach is that it's going to create all the pages needed for the CRUD operations. So uh, based on the model, it's able to define a whole bunch of views. So you can see I've got a cr create view. I've got delete, details, edit, index, et cetera. And so all that is generated for me by, by the tooling experience. And then let's go ahead and create a controller for category. And choose the model category. And then we'll use the same. Oh, sorry. One, one thing to note before you do that, do another build. And that way, the Northwind context is available. So now when I come here to uh, create this controller, you can see the Northwind, Northwind context is now available as a data context class. So category. Choose the category model. Go ahead and add that. Now, when this is completed, I could hit F5. And by default, um, Entity Framework is going to use SQL Express to uh, act as the database uh, for the application. Now, I don't want to use SQL Express. I want to use SQL Azure. And so before I hit F5, I'm going to make a couple of changes to, uh, to make this possible. So I'm going to come into my web.config. And you can see here I've got uh, connection strings. I'm going, to use, uh, I'm going to add the connection string that I'm going to use. And uh, oops, wrong command. And I've got a snippet for it. So the database connection string here is just, it's still a provider of uh, SQL or system.data.sql client. The difference here is that the server name points to a TCP endpoint. Uh, up in the cloud. So this is the SQL Azure service endpoint that I'm interacting with. The very first part of it right here, that's my database server name. And so the, the whole URI defines where I'm going to call out to in, in order to interact with SQL Azure. The reason this works and the reason that all that needs to be changed is just uh, the server attribute and the connection string is because SQL Azure um, has a TDS endpoint. So it's a tabular data stream is the protocol used by SQL Server, and it's the same protocol used by SQL Azure. So just by defi or changing the endpoint that I'm c communicating with in the connection string, I can now start communicating with SQL Azure. Of course, you need to make sure also that that port is open so that you can communicate with it. Um, so now I've created that connection string. Now I'm going to come back to the uh, Northwind context. And one of the things that's nice about this is um, there's a convention where what I can do is create the constructor. And in it, in the constructor right here, you'll see I've defined, let me zoom in on that, Northwind DB. This is the name of the connection string that's in the web.config file. So when I create a new instance of the Northwind uh, context, it's going to grab the connection string from the web.config file, which has now been defined to use SQL Azure. So now if I hit F5 and run this, um, what it's going to do is uh, when I first hit one of the controllers for either category or product, Entity Framework is going to go check to see if that database exists. And if it doesn't, it's going to create it. So I'm going to go ahead and go to category first. And uh, it's going to generate that database. And it's empty. But what I can see here is if I come into the management portal, um, and you'll see that the Northwind DB does not exist. If I refresh this page, you'll see now that Northwind database is here. So the Entity Framework 4.1 using code first generated that database based on the model, which is kind of neat. Um, in fact, if I come here to uh, manage, I can manage that database through the uh, SQL Azure Database Manager. And I guess I need to uh, agree. Log in. And so this gives you a kind of an SSMS or SQL Server Management uh, Studio experience, but it's a Silverlight application available in the cloud. And you can see I've got 
my categories as well as products available here. So by default right now, uh, if I take a look at the data tab, I don't have any data in the database. So let's go ahead and fix that real quick. So I'm going to create a new, new category. Uh, we'll create beverages. And then I'll create another category called condiments. And so now if I come back to uh, Studio here and refresh. Close and here you can see now beverages and condiments have been created. So I am communicating to SQL Azure. Let's do a couple of other things here in the application. Let's go to uh, our products. Oops, product. And we'll create a couple new products. So let's create uh, chai tea, very expensive chai tea. And that's a beverage. And then we'll create uh, syrup. And that's a condiment. And so now we've got some data here that uh, this application is a, it's an MVC application using SQL Azure. What we can do is start using Windows Azure storage and blob, the blob storage to uh, uh, pull some images. So I've already got uh, some images that have been uploaded into blob storage. In fact, using this tool that's provided by um, a, a company, uh, it's Cloud Explorer, I can see here that in blob storage, I've got an images container um, right here, and in it, I've got two images, chai tea and syrup. So what I'm going to do is grab the URL, URL uh, for these images, come back to the application, and let's edit this real quick. So we'll put a picture URL for the chai tea, and then we'll also do that for the uh, syrup. So that's now displaying that URL. Uh, it'd be better if we actually showed the image. So if I come here to my product index, what I'll do is let's, let's wrap this with an image tag. And go ahead and refresh the page. And so now what we have is an application that's built using SQL Azure as well as Windows Azure Storage um, to, to, to uh, run that page. Now, the only thing we're not using here right now is Windows Azure Compute. And so what I want to show is how similar just your ASP.NET MVC application is to an application running in Windows Azure. So what I'll do is create a new project. And this project is going to be a cloud project, and it's the Windows Azure project. This is the project that's installed by the Windows Azure SDK. And we'll go ahead and add this. Now, with it uh, comes the ability to attach a number of roles. So you can add an ASP.NET web role, which is really just an ASP.NET web application that's already been set up to run within Windows Azure. You also have MVC2 web roles. Now, the, the Windows Azure tooling is a few months behind the ASP.NET release cycle. So soon we'll have an update to the tools that by default will have MVC3 as part of the tooling experience. It is not part of that today. Um, but we also have other types. So WCF service web role, which essentially is just a web role, an ASP.NET web application that's set up for WCF by default. And then we've got this worker role. A worker role is a, is a, is a type of project that essentially uh, runs in the background. So it's a headless project. It doesn't have a web application or a web service. It's more akin to a Windows service within Windows Azure. So it's some kind of process that's running in the background. And so you can create a web role project from the tooling here as well. And then the last one here is a CGI web role. And the CGI web role is really def uh, is there for things like PHP. So it's set up in such a way that you can use fast CGI to run something like PHP with an IS. Um, now, in this case, I already have my ASP.NET MVC application created, so I'm not going to add any role to the project. I'm just going to create a blank Windows Azure project. Now that I've created that, what I can do is right-click on roles, click Add, and say Web Role Project in Solution. I'm going to 
grab that MVC application. So now I've got a Windows Azure uh, project that's referencing my ASP.NET MVC app. Now, it doesn't have all the components that typically come with a default web role project. So for instance, uh, there are some assemblies as well as some configuration settings in the web.config that uh, allow the, the Windows Azure services to interact and understand what it is that your application is doing. And so you can add these manually if you wanted to. So you could right click and add references, or you could modify the web.config file. Uh, but one thing that I think is kind of neat is you can also use NuGet. And online is, if you search for Windows Azure, is a NuGet package. Here, let's try that again. Windows Azure. Right here is a Windows Azure Web Role. And if you install this, what this is going to do is it's going to add all the assemblies, uh, the update the web.config file, and then also it creates a class file that I'll show you in a moment. So now you can see over here oops, that we've got these Microsoft.WindowsAzure assemblies that have been added. Uh, we also have an update to our webconfig file. see here. Right here, it registers system.diagnostics. And this is a way so that when you trace out, it will use uh, Windows Azure Diagnostics as a way of capturing traces and information within the, the web roles. And then lastly, it's created this webroll.cs file. And this is an important file because uh, what it is is it's a, uh, it's a class that's inheriting from the uh, role entry point. The role entry point is the hook that is generated between the, the, the services controller running in Windows Azure and your instance. So whenever it starts up, it calls into the role entry point, and it's a place where you can run some code in the background. So you can see here by default, um, it, it has a run method where it just loops through all the time. And right now, by default, it's just writing a line out saying working. If you needed to do some kind of background processing or collection of diagnostics information or something like that, you can use this role entry point as the place to do that. So having added all of that at this point, what I can do is hit F5, and you can see that the Windows Azure project is the startup project. And when I run this, what this is going to do is run a local compute emulator that runs and simulates the Windows Azure fabric controller and runs my web role locally. So if I hit F5, it's going to start up. Right down here, you can see it started up the storage and the uh, compute emulator. I'll go ahead and show those. And so here, this is simulating the cloud locally so you can do all your local development um, on your machine. And I've got one instance of my MVC application running. You can see it just called into that on start, and it's just going to start running the app. Um, here, you can see here's the application running, and it's running on the local host on port 81. Now, the reason it's port 81 is in here under the service details, even though it's mapped to 80, um, it, it's running on port 81 so that it allows you to run multiple instances of this application locally to simulate a mul you know, multiple instances running. Um, so for instance, I can come into, let me go ahead and close this, to my service model and make a change where instead of just running one instance of this application, I can run two. So we'll go ahead and now make that change and when I hit F5 to run again, instead of just seeing one instance of my application, I'm going to have two instances of that running. And so this allows me to test my application locally, um, even with multiple instances of my application running. And when we come back to the emulator, you can see here now, instead of having just one, I've got two. So I've got this instance and this instance uh, running. And so uh, based, on, um, based on the emulator here, I can start interacting with it across port 81. And uh, it's going to load balance all this traffic and these requests between the different instances that are running in the emulator. 
So at this point, we've showed uh, a, a simple demo that leverages all these core services, so Windows Azure Compute, Windows Azure Storage, along with SQL Azure Database. So we'll shut that down and uh, come back to the presentation. All right. So some quick, quick history. Um, looking back at the platform, uh, we first released and announced the platform in October of 2008. Uh, that was at PDC, uh, PDC 2008. And um, it, in fact, it, when we first announced it, we actually called it the Azure Services Platform. We changed that pretty shortly thereafter to the Windows Azure Platform. When we announced, uh, we had some core services. So we had Windows Azure Compute, Windows Azure Storage, uh, but we also had a, uh, a storage service called SQL, uh, SQL Data Services. And the SQL Data Services was a NoSQL-like data structure um, that was very similar to Windows Azure Table Storage. And one of the things we heard as feedback is that that type of a storage service wasn't as interesting to people. And so at Mix, we announced that the SQL Data Services was going to be turned into a relational data mo database model, which is what SQL Azure is today. So at, in, in March of 2009, that's when these three core services really first were available um, as part of the CTP. And so we had compute, storage, and database as part of the Windows Azure platform. In November of 2009, we announced a number of updates, um, including some very important things, um, such as uh, uh, the release of Project Dallas, or excuse me, the, the, the announcement or the CTP of Project Dallas. But we also enabled uh, full trust in the platform. Prior to this, we only allowed code to be executed in partial trust. And so full trust allowed you to do additional things, like take advantage of fast, fast CGI in IIS and, do, and run things like PHP in the platform. Additionally, full trust allowed you to take a runtime, such as Java, and move that up into the platform and start executing and running Java applications against that runtime as well. Um, so, so those were some important updates. And then in February of 2010, so just a little over a year ago, was when we went generally, generally available, so when we first went into production. And so it's interesting to look at this. Windows Azure has only been in production for a little over a year. Um, prior to that, it was um, a CTP environment. Um, last June, we announced some important updates to the Windows Azure platform, including support for the .NET 4.0 framework, some different OS versions that were available, and we also introduced the CDN as a service as part of the platform. And we also had some updates to SQL Azure as well, increased the database size up to 50 gigabytes, uh, introduced support for spatial data types, and also allowed you to use data access uh, components as a way of deploying your application, excuse me, data tier applications, as a way of deploying your databases up into SQL Azure. Now, last November at PDC 11, uh, we had a number of other updates that were really important. And I'm going to show some demonstrations of some of these in a moment, but it's worth, worth talking through these. Uh, the first was we updated the portal. Uh, so you already got a uh, look at the portal. We introduced a Silverlight-based portal that uh, made it a lot easier to interact with the services and manage your, your services. Um, we also introduced the ability to have multiple service administrators for your apps. So prior to this, there was a one-to-one -one relationship between the live ID that was used within the platform um, and your, your applications. Now with this update, you can create co-administrators so that if you have a development team, you can add some additional developers or some other folks in your organization as co-admins to your, to your Windows Azure applications so that they can manage and deploy and, and interact with them. We also uh, opened up a remote desktop, which means that once you've deployed your applications, you have the ability to remote into it or RDP into the instance. And this is particularly important for debugging. Um, I found that prior to the fact, you have to be very good about collecting uh, information and logs and errors elsewhere in order to figure out what's going on. With remote desktop, it gives you the ability to remote into the machine and see exactly what's going on. We also provided uh, full IIS support. And this is kind of a strange sounding name, but the reason we call, it, we call it full IIS is because prior to this, we used something called hostable web core. And so hostable web core 
is a IIS-like uh, way of running applications, but it's not full IIS. So a lot of the things that you can take advantage of within IIS, things like the ability to prime or auto-start applications, or smooth streaming support, or even things like web deploy, are not, were not available as part of hostable web core. They are a part of IIS. And so with full IIS, we have the ability to take advantage of some of these other capabilities of, of IIS. We also announced uh, the ability to change the OS family uh, for your instances and use Windows Server 2008 R2. And one of the nice things about this is that you also get IIS 7.5 as part of it. Prior to this, it was all Windows Server 2008 SP1, I believe. Now, you can still use that version of the OS. You just declare it as part of your OS family within your service model. And I already mentioned that with this came IS 7.5 and, and 7.0. We also introduced the concept of elevated privileges. And I'll demonstrate this in a moment, but it gives you the ability to install software as an admin prior to your instance starting up. Um, and I'll, I'll show you a demo that makes this clear. Um, November, we also opened up the CTP for Windows Azure Connect. Windows Azure Connect is a service that allows you to do low-level IPsec uh, communications between your application running out Windows Azure and your local on-premises environment. And so what this means is you can create an IPsec tunnel between your app deployed in Windows Azure and your local environment. Uh, an example of this might be an application, like a web application, running in, in Windows Azure that's communicating to an on-premises SQL Server environment. And because this IPsec connection is there, it'll, it makes it so that it looks like everything's on the same network. So you can just refer to that database server or that environment by name, and it will route the traffic accordingly. So the Windows Azure Connect CTP was announced. And we also announced the Windows Azure Virtual Machine Role. Now, Virtual Machine Role is a type of role that is designed to make it easier for you to migrate existing applications into Windows Azure. It is not infrastructure as a service. So it's not just giving you the ability to define your own VHD and then manage and run those things independently. Because the virtual machine role still runs under the same concept and guidelines as a web role and a worker role. And what that means is that the state of the instance is not preserved when it's restarted. So if you, you took, an app, if you took a, a VM role and created a VHD and installed all your software on it and deployed it into Windows Azure, It'll run fine, but any time it restarts, because maybe it got some OS patches, or if there was hardware failure and it got shut down and started up somewhere else, any changes that were made to the VM role from when you first created the image will be gone, because any time it starts up, it uses that base VHD or that base image as the starting point. So the purpose of the VM role is not to give you something like infrastructure as a service. It's designed to make it easier for you to define your environment with the software and everything you need to run your applications um, so that it makes it easier to port existing applications to Windows Azure. And then lastly, we provided support for uh, extra small instances, which are um, basically, there's four different size of instances. We have uh, extra large, large, um, excuse me, large, uh, medium, small, and then an extra small instance now available um, so that it provides a smaller and a cheaper price point for people to run applications in the platform. Now, full IS, I, I went through this a little bit. Um, one of the things that's really important to understand is that with full IS, it enables a lot of new scenarios that previously hadn't been possible. The first and probably one of the most useful ones is within IS, you can run multiple websites. And so what this means is that you can define within the service model multiple websites and deploy more than one website into your role instance. And you would end up using host headers as a way to route traffic to those sites running in Windows Azure. So I could take, let's say for my, my personal websites, I have a blog and then maybe I've got 
a, a, a uh, CRM application running. I can run both the CRM application as one website and within IS, and I can take the blog and run that as another website in IS, package that all up into my, my uh, Windows Azure package, and deploy that to a set of instances. This allows me to run multiple websites in these instances without having to create uh, you know, you know, more than one instance and then partition these, these websites across them. So it allows you to maximize and more ef effectively use, uh, uh, use your role instances. You also can do the same thing with virtual directories. So within IIS, you can define virtual directories underneath the root website. And this is another way to, to create additional capabilities and, and deploy more than one application into your role instances. Um, and then I mentioned other things like configuring IIS, so you can even get to things like modifying your app pools um, and so forth, and then also uh, uh, using other capabilities like web deploy. Now, with the elevated privileges comes the ability to also use things such as startup tasks and admin mode. And what's really nice about this is startup tasks gives you the way to install software that doesn't already exist in the base uh, web role or worker role image. And so a good example is um, within Windows Azure web roles, we don't have the MVC uh, templates installed. So if you take an MVC application and deploy it into Windows Azure, Windows Azure doesn't have what, you know, the, the MVC assemblies and everything already running up in, in that role instance. And so with a startup task, you can do something like this where um, bef before people can start hitting your web application, when the instance starts up, it's going to run this startup task and run this command. So in this case, it's install mvc.cmd, and it's going to run that command, and when that command exits, um, that's when it's going to finally make your role instance available uh, through the load balancer. So I think, let me show you a demo of this. Because the application that we built here, if we go to publish this to Windows Azure, um, it, it wouldn't run because the web role, by default, doesn't have MVC installed in it. So we can fix this by, by using the startup task. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new folder. And this is just a convention I like. I like to create a folder called startup. And in that folder, I'm going to add some existing items that I already have here. And I'll show you what I've got. So I'm adding the ASP.NET MVC3 setup, so the, the actual MSI that installs MVC. And I'm, in, I'm also adding this uh, command file. The first thing that you should always do is make sure to set this to copy always. And that's because when we package the Windows Azure application, it's gonna, we want it to include this CMD file and the uh, ASP.NET MVC setup um, file as well. So by setting copy always, when we build and create the package that gets uploaded to Windows Azure, it's going to include these resources as part of it. Now I've added these. Um, let's take a look at the... Uh, this command as well. And you can see all it's doing is it's invoking the setup. Um, what's very important right here, this slash Q, runs it as a silent install. And it's important to understand that when I deploy this, there's no operator that's waiting and able to interact with any sort of UI request. So if something needs me to accept something or you know, provide any sort of input back through the UI, I can't do that because this is all being you know, installed and run, run um, you know, uh, as uh, it's, it's all being done automatically as part of Windows Azure, and so I can't get involved. So this runs this silently, and then I also log everything out to an HTML file in case there is some problems. I can always take a look at that file later. The last thing it does is it has this uh, graceful exit out of the script. Now, this is important because what I mentioned is when, when this thing starts up, by default, um, it's not going to allow that, uh, any traffic to get to your role instances until it's in a ready state. And with the startup task, if it doesn't exit gracefully, then it's going to assume that something happened in the startup task in incorrectly. There was some kind of a failure. And it's not going to mark your application in the ready state, so no traffic's going to be routed to it. So I use this exit slash b0 to exit, the start, uh, to, to exit this script. And that way, the startup task knows that everything exited correctly and gracefully and is able to move forward. So that's this. Now, the other thing I need to do is modify the service model, um, kind of the instructions for Windows Azure, to tell it to run this script 
uh, to tell it to run this script when it starts up the instance. And so this can be done in the uh, service definition file. And I'm going to come to, let's put it right here, and uh, I've got a snippet for it. And it's, it's a really pretty simple command here. Basically, we defined what the command is to run, so startup um, slash install mvc.cmd. So this will get executed. And there's also an, uh, excuse me, an execution context of elevated right here. And elevated means that it's going to run as an administrator, or at least with administrator privileges, so that it can install this software into the role instance. And then the last thing is this task type of simple. Now, simple is the default. Um, by default, it's going to run as simple. And simple basically means don't allow traffic to route to this role instance until it's finished running the, running the, uh, the uh, startup task. Um, you can also choose um, some other types. There's uh, foreground and background. Uh, essentially, background is the, the most useful one. By running it as a background task, what that means is that it's going to actually allow you to send traffic through the load balancer, even if it hasn't completed running the startup task. Now, only, you should only use this for like, development and debugging purposes. And why this is nice is I can run this, this startup task as a background task. If something fails, since traffic is still routing to the role instance, I can RDP or remote into that role instance and debug things if I need to. Um, so it gives you some, some opportunities to change those semantics to, you know, to either make it um, easier for you to develop and debug, or if you're, if you're going to be running this as a production service, uh, you should just use simple. So with that, um, when I go to deploy this, it's going to use that startup task. So let me show you what it would look like if I were to deploy it. So I can come here to my Windows Azure project, right-click and choose Publish. Now, you can publish directly from Visual Studio. And so you can see here I can define you know, the hosted services and choose the environment. But I can also just create a service package. And so by choosing the service package, if I hit OK, what it's going to do is take my application and package it up in a CSPKG file. Essentially, a CSPKG file is a zip with all my assets in it um, that I can, then I can now upload into Windows Azure. Um, Let's give it a moment so that it creates that. It's taking a little bit of time here because it's also including the uh, MVC uh, installer. And when it's completed, it's going to have a CSPKG file, and it's also going to include this service configuration file as well. Now, the service configuration file uh, is, a, is an interesting file. What it does is it allows me to define some of the settings um, that define how I want Windows Azure to run my application. So for instance, you can see here is the instance count of two. So that means that I want my application to run in multiple instances. Um, I can also define uh, uh, different other things like the OS family. So by default, OS family one would be Windows Server SP1. OS family two is Windows Server, um, Windows Server 2008 R2. Um, and so I can define some of this metadata and some of these, uh, this, these things here. Um, I also have the ability to find settings and other, configura inf other configuration information that I might want to leverage at runtime. So it's created the package and the, the file. So I can come here to the portal and come here to my hosted services. And let's just choose a project. Um, here I've got a web deploy project. I've already got. Um, this deployed to production. So I have this running as a production service, but I also have a staging environment. And what's nice about having both a production environment and staging environment is that I can deploy my application to staging, and I can call this v.1.1. Uh, and this way, I can deploy an update into the platform. It'll run in staging. I can test it, make sure everything's running. And when I'm happy with it, I can do what's called a VIP swap and promote my staging environment to my production environment. And what that does is it actually just changes instructions in the load balancer. So all traffic coming to the production environment will now come to what had previously been the staging environment. So it allows me to pretty easily upgrade my application without introducing any sort of downtime. And so. Let me come here to my packages. And I'll choose the CSPKG file. And I'm also going to provide the, uh, the configuration file. And go ahead and click up OK. 
And so what this will do is upload my, my files and start provisioning a new staging environment with these resources. And then once it's done deploying, I could do that VIP swap. Um, you can see right here, uh, it's grayed out because it's not, not deployed yet. But this right here, this VIP swap, once my service is running, I can click that button and it'll change the uh, way in which uh, it'll basically move staging to production and production to staging. What's also nice about that is if I did introduce some kind of a bug or a problem um, with that update, I still have my previous versions running in staging, and I could always switch it back if I needed to. So um, it takes about 8 to 12 minutes to um, deploy your instances. Also, you have to uh, consider that there's the startup task that's also going to run. So MVC3 takes anywhere from two to four minutes to install. So you've got to figure that it's going to add that much more time onto your, to your instance. I already have, um, I previously deployed this as well, so you could take a look at it. And here in production, I can, let me click on that link. And you can see I have that MVC application running up at my cloud app uh, .NET address. And so it is running MVC3 with the Razor syntax. And so it, what that means is that it, was, it successfully ran that startup task to install MVC into the role instances. So all right. So that's startup tasks. Startup tasks allow for you to do a lot of things. Um, I actually have a, a blog post and an example published on using startup tasks to install encoder exp uh, expression encoder in a set of worker roles so that you can do video encoding in Windows Azure as well. So basically, you can use startup tasks to install just about anything you need within your role instances. Now, some of the other services, um, or one of the other services that we have within Windows Azure is a content delivery network. And what a content delivery network does is it makes it uh, easier for you to take static data um, and make it closer to the users that end up needing to use it. So for instance, if I have my applications deployed into a data center in North America, I may have a bunch of videos or images associated with that application. I can use the CDN so that after someone makes a request of these videos, it'll start caching those videos in the CDN or in that, that CDN node closer to the end user so that anyone else that is near that location is going to start benefiting from having that resource closer to them rather than having to go all the way back to North America or to that data center to download it uh, the first time. And so we have 24 uh, CDNs available globally. Um, that, that you can tap into. And uh, it's, it's really simple to leverage. Um, I'll show you in a moment. But basically, you enable this through the platform. You can go to your storage service. And in your blobs, you can just tell it to enable the CDN for your, your blobs and within storage service. And uh, it'll start using the CDN as part of that. Um, one thing, some, some enhancements that recently have come are the ability to also serve up some static data um, within your Windows Azure compute instances. So if you consider the fact that in your, in your web applications, you have a lot of things like CSS files or images or um, things, you know, style sheets and things that are usually a part of your web application. Through a convention, you can tell the CDN to also cache that data in the CDN nodes uh, located around the world. We also introduced uh, support for HTTPS through the CDNs recently as well. Um, and then at Mix, we announced that um, we're soon going to have a CTP of smooth streaming, so IS smooth streaming, available through the CDN. And so this is really nice because it enables uh, your users to um, get a better experience when playing videos um, uh, that you end up serving up. So the CTP of smooth streaming should be um, coming pretty soon, probably within the next month or so. And so let me just show you real quick uh, how to do that. Let's see. So if I come back to the management portal, you'll see that right up here, I have uh, CDN as one of the uh, tabs that are available to me. So I can click CDN. And what it's going to do is enumerate the various resources that I can turn the CDN on. And let that load up. Uh, it's going to list both the compute resources as well as storage. And that's because um, 
storage, I can, I can essentially take the blobs and containers within storage and serve that up via the CDN, but I can also, as I mentioned, uh, take some of the static resources within my compute instances and attach it to the CDN. And so, basically, if I wanted to take, let's say, uh, this vNow storage service, I could say new endpoint and turn it on. So you can see here I'm in, I can enable the CDN. I could turn on HTTPS as well as query string support through it and go ahead and click OK. Now, it does take about an hour. Um, and usually it's a little bit faster, but it does take a little bit of time for that CDN to turn on and uh, make it available via DNS to start r resolving it. So I already have um, on my Wade Scratch storage service the CDN turned on. Now, Wade Scratch is the same one where, uh, the, if you recall, the images that I pointed to before, the chai tea and the syrup, those are located within Wade Scratch. So what this means is that I can start leveraging the CDN to service up these images. And it's pretty straightforward. If I come back to the uh, portal, you'll see that there's a uh, default HTTP endpoint associated to it. And so this is a DNS name that when it resolves, it's going to resolve to the local, lo excuse me, resolve to the closest CDN node. Um, and if there is a cached version of that image available, it'll load it. If that cached image isn't yet in the CDN, it'll go to Windows Azure Storage, grab that image, put it into the cache, and then return it to me. And then any user that hits that resource from here on is going to benefit from having that item in the cache. And so I'm going to grab this and then come back to, uh, to my application. And I'm going to comment out this startup task, because I'm going to run this locally, and I don't want to reinstall MVC. And let's hit F5 to start up my application. And what I'm going to do is modify uh, my products, so instead of pointing directly to my storage service, my blob storage service, I want it to load up the image via the CDN. And so we'll let this start, and we'll come here to product. And let's go ahead and edit this. And instead of having it point to Wade Scratch dot blobs, et cetera, uh, we're going to point it to the CDN. So we'll update that. Oops, doesn't look like I copied it. Come back. All right. And then save that. And you see it refreshed. And then let's update this one as well. Save that. And so now if you take a look at the properties on it, you'll see that it's servicing it up, serving it up via the CDN. So very easy to use the CDN. All right. Now, uh, we've had another uh, service in the platform within, um, actually back since we released or announced the CTP in 2008 called the Access Control Service. And at Mix 11, we announced the V2 of this service, so the Access Control Service 2.0, that provides a number of additional capabilities. I mean, it's, it's a much more powerful service. Uh, one of the things that you can do now is um, leverage existing identity providers um, as part of your applications. So for instance, if I want users to come to my application and log in, rather than having to define you know, a membership provider that stores usernames and passwords in a SQL database or somewhere else, I can just let them choose which identity provider they want to leverage, so LiveID or Facebook, Yahoo, Google, or even an Active Directory account. Let them use that identity and interact with my website once they've authenticated to that, uh, authenticated to those that service. So um, this is made pr uh, possible because of the support for things like WS Federation, WS Trust, OpenID, and OAuth as part of the platform. So some really neat updates to the Access Control Service. This has actually been available in the App Fabric Labs environment, which is the CTP environment, since PDC last year. Um, but now uh, it's uh, been uh, the Access Control Service 2.0 is available in production within the Windows Azure platform. Uh, if you've used a Windows Identity Foundation, um, you'll be happy to know that with the Access Control Service, you can continue to use uh, Windows Identity Foundation uh, to, to uh, program against the Access Control Service. 
And the access control service itself is all REST-based, uh, REST and it also has a REST-based management API. So you can, you, can program, you can programmatically interact with the access control service through this REST API to manage and uh, control um, the ACS service, or the access control service. And I mentioned that it's now available. Um, through the end of this year, um, it's going to actually be available at no charge. And then come uh, January 1st of next year, it's going to use the model of uh, $1.99 for 100,000 transactions. So that's 100,000 you know, uh, interactions with uh, the access control service. So it's a, it's a, a pretty good, good price point. And so what I'm going to do is show how we can take our MVC application and plug in ACS to uh, require someone to authenticate against uh, a to authenticate against our application before they can do various things in it. And so what I'm going to do is come to back to the portal, and you can see that there is a tab down here called Service Bus Access Control and Caching. I'm going to click this. And I already created a namespace or an access control namespace, but I haven't done anything with that yet. And that's because when you create a new namespace, it takes about three or four minutes, and I didn't want to wait um, it, by creating it uh, in front of you all. So I'm going to select that and go to the access control service. And this will take me to a portal built on top of the management APIs. So everything I do here in this portal, I could do programmatically against the REST API. But it's nice that we also have a portal experience that makes it easier to interact with the access control service. So the very first thing I'm going to do is um, define my entity provi identity providers. And this is the existing identities I want people to be able to use when they interact with my website. So by default, this includes Windows Live ID. I can click Add, and I'm going to go ahead and add Yahoo, and just choose the defaults. And so now I'm saying, hey, you can log into my website using Windows Live ID or Yahoo. Um, I also need to define the relying party. And this is actually the application that uh, I'm running. And so the, one of the easiest ways, I think, to go about doing this is when you run your application, I'll go ahead and start this up again. It's the, the relying party is defined by the URL or the URI of your application. So when I start this application up, um, what I'm going to do is just grab that right there. So you know the URL, I'm going to use that as part of this. So I'm going to create a new relying party. And I'm just going to call it the local host, since I'm going to be running it local. And the realm is that URL. Also, I'm going to use that for the return URL. And then there's a bunch of other settings. Uh, I'm going to use the defaults, but you can do things such as uh, control the token format, encryption policy, the token lifetime, when, uh, you know, when it'll expire, et cetera. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and save that. And so now I've defined the rely relying party uh, that uh, I'm going to use against the access control service. And then the last thing that I'm going to do is define some rule groups. Now, the re what these rule groups do, and, and by the way, Vittorio Bertacci, who's the uh, technical evangelist for identity, is going to go into this much, much greater depth tomorrow. Um, so definitely, if you're interested in this, uh, go to his session. Uh, but the, the rule groups allow me to map the claims that come from the identity providers, such as Live ID and Yahoo, to the claims that I'm going to use within my application. And so this is part of the abstraction that um, allows, allows me to use the access control service to manage identity with my application and not have to worry about the different formats and protocols and such used by the underlying identity providers. And so I'm going to go ahead and generate the default rules. I'm going to do it for Live ID and Yahoo. And go ahead and generate them. And then you can see it's created rules here um, on how to interact with Yahoo and Li uh, Live ID. Go ahead and save those. And so now I've defined the rule groups. Now the last thing I want to do is grab this. Well, I'll grab it in a moment. But I'm going to use this WS Federation metadata URL as part of um, a way of updating my application to tell it to interact with the access control service. Now, the rest of the operation, when I interact with my application, I'm going to use the Windows Identity Foundation and the tooling that comes with Visual Studio to, uh, to wire it up to use the access control service. And so if I come to my MVC application, I can right click. And you'll see here there's a add STS reference, or add a security token service reference. And so I'm going to 
I'm going to add an STS reference, and the very first thing it wants is the URI of my application. So this is the same URI that we defined for the relying party. And I'm going to click Next. And then it's going to ask uh, for me to define what the security token service options are. Um, and I'm going to use an existing uh, STS, and I'm going to put in the URL, and that's, that's this URL right here. And so this is the WS Federation metadata URL. And so by putting this into the tooling, it allows Windows Identity Foundation to um, understand how to interact with the access control service. So I can click Next. I'm just going to choose the defaults. I'm OK with it not doing certificate chain validation. Next, and then Finish. And so the tooling here has done a couple of things. Um, it's added a bunch of uh, some references. So it added references to Windows Identity Foundation. And then it also updated my web.config file. And uh, let me show you. So you can see it added this section, and, and it updated other sections as well, but uh, this Microsoft.identity model section. And it's got a bunch of things configured and defined based on information it was able to pull out of that Federation metadata URL. And the last thing I'm going to do is um, make an update right here. And uh, let's see. Basically, what I'm doing is uh, turning re request validation off just for the demo. And then I'm also setting the HTTP runtime for the request validation mode of 2.0. And this is, this is just going to allow me to, to run this application um, and leverage um, Windows Identity Foundation uh, as part of the, um, the identity solution. So uh, make those updates. Build, and we go ahead and run. And so we'll see right off the bat that the interaction with the website is a little bit different. Uh, rather than going directly to the home controller and rendering the index view, um, what it's going to do is force me to log in. And that's because by default, when I uh, use the tooling for add STS reference, it basically denies any unauthenticated user to the website. And so I have to choose the identity provider I want to use. And this page here is called the Home Realm Discovery page. And it's basically allowing me to choose which identity provider I want to authenticate with. So let's go ahead and I'll choose Yahoo. And not sure why that did that. Um, choose my Yahoo ID, um, yahoo.com. Enter my password. Sign in. And, by, uh, and this is an experience that's consistent for Facebook, Yahoo, uh, Google, basically just authorizing, um, authorizing the STS. And, and basically, it's just a security setting, saying that I agree to send this information to uh, the access control service. And when I agree, uh, what it's doing now is taking my claims from Yahoo, passing it to the Access Control Service, that's getting mapped to a set of claims that I use within my application. And now you can see up here that I'm a known entity and I'm logged in as Wade Wegner. Now, this is a pretty broad uh, use of, of uh, the Access Control Service. And in this case, I want people to come to the main page, but I just want to secure and make people log in when they go to the product and category controllers. And so what I'm going to do is come to this authorization setting uh, where it is denying uh, unauthenticated users. I'm going to comment this out. And then what you can do is come to the controller itself and uh, put, put the authorization information here. So for instance, I can come to product, and I can end up saying um, authorize let's see, authorize roles equals admin. And so now, what did I do wrong? Now when I hit F5, Um, when I hit the main page on my home controller, uh, it's going to run just fine because unauthenticated users are allowed to render that page. Uh, but if I come then to the product page, it, I think it's probably going to here. Go ahead and choose, choose Yahoo. Let's log in again. I don't know why it keeps doing that. All right, this time I'm going to keep keep me signed in. 
And now when I hit the home controller, it's going to say, hey, are you part or do you have a role of admin? And I don't um, because there's no claim coming from the access control service right now that defines my user as an admin. So what I can do is um, I can fix that. So I can come here to our rule groups. And what I'm going to do is create a new rule that basically says, let's go ahead and do this. So when using Yahoo, um, if the incoming email address claim equals wade.wegner at yahoo.com, um, go ahead uh, and, um, yeah, if it's at wade.wegner at yahoo.com, go ahead and create a role claim of type admin. And go ahead and save that. And so now I've created this new rule, and then one thing to note, you do have to make sure that the, uh, the casing and so forth is identical. But now when I, let's go ahead and uh, run this application again. Now when, um, I come, when I get the claim back from the access control service, it's going to have inspected the email address that came from Yahoo. It'll see that it's wade.wegner at yahoo.com, and it'll add a roles claim of admin. So go ahead and come here to product. Choose Yahoo. I think it should remember me this time. And it should load up the page. Product, it didn't. Admin. Sorry, maybe I didn't set the role right. So Yahoo. Oh, sorry about that. I, I, I made a mistake here. Um, it should be select type of email address of value wade.wegner at yahoo.com. So I put, I put the value in the wrong spot. So apologies. Let's go ahead and save that update. And let's try that again. So this time, we'll, we'll hit the page. We'll hit the products page. And uh, once I authenticate, it should pass through. Product, Yahoo, and hopefully I'm authorized now to view the page. And there we go. So this allows me to have more granular authorization control on my action views within home controllers rather than just doing a blanket um, uh, you know, blanketing it so that uh, everyone has to be authenticated to hit the website. All right, so moving on. Uh, so one of the other services we have is uh, the caching service. This service was announced last PDC, and just at Mix, we announced that this service, which has currently been in CTP, will be moved into production by the end of the month. And the caching service provides a uh, distributed in-memory cache for running your applications. And so what that means is it's distributed, it's running across multiple instances up in, the, in Windows Azure, and it's in-memory. And so being in-memory means that you have very fast access to, to this data. And um, if any of you are familiar with Windows Server App Fabric Caching, the Windows Azure App Fabric Caching service is a managed, managed version of it. So instead of you having to you know, create your own cache and set up your, your instances and install the software and set up a, a cluster and make sure it's distributed, it's a managed service that we run for you. All you do is create it, define the size that you want for the cache, and start using it within your application. Um, it's very easy to interact with uh, via .NET. Um, and in fact, it actually uh, runs as a net TCP service, and uh, it's a WCF endpoint, which means that you really have to use the .NET client library today to interact with it. But one of the things that uh, is on our roadmap is a, an interoperable uh, endpoint that you could use in other, uh, other technologies and other frameworks. One thing that's also nice about the caching service is that it comes with a session state provider by default. And so this session state provider gives you the ability to externalize your state outside of your role instances within the cache. And so this is really nice because um, it makes sure that it's in memory, it's very fast, but it also brings some consistency in terms of session state data to all your role instances. 
Um, it's very easy to use. You just configure it, choose your cache size, and then write code against it. And in terms of Windows Server App Fabric caching, it's the exact same uh, semantic. So it's the same API. Um, the applications and stuff that you write for Windows Server App Fabric um, is, is semantically the same as Windows uh, Azure App Fabric caching. And then, like I said, by the end of the month, it will be in production, available in all the Windows Azure data centers. Right now, for the CTP, it's only available in the US South data center. And so let me give you a quick demonstration of the caching service. Now today, I mentioned that it is, it's running in a, a CTP environment. And so what I'm going to do is browse to that environment. It's at portal.appfabric fabriclabs.com and go ahead and log into it. And this portal looks very similar to the, the production Windows Azure environment, except that it's only for the at fabric services. So you'll just see service bus access control and caching. Now if I come to the cache, um, I already have a cache uh, built and configured and I'll, I'll use that for the demo, but I'll show you what it's like to create a new cache as well. So I can create a new new cache, um, I'll define the subscription, and then I can choose a name. So I can end up saying, you know, Tech Days Demo 1. See if that's available. Now, when it's in production, it'll be in multiple data centers. Today, it's just in the South Central. Um, so that's the only one available for the region. Um, and also, there's different cache sizes. Um, Today in CTP, there's only two cache sizes, 128 and 256. Uh, in the production service, we'll support up to four gigabyte uh, cache sizes. So you'll be able to store quite a bit more in, the, in that cache. So I'll choose 256, click OK, and it's going to create this cache. So one of the, I mean, this is one of the values. Within you know, 30 to 60 seconds, this cache will be created, and you'll be able to start using that within your application. Um, What's nice also is in the portal, we have this button called View Client Configuration. And when you select that, it's going to show you um, all the config information that you can use to, uh, to reference the, the cache within your application. So this, this is data that you'd be able to put in your app.config or your web.config file in order to tell it how to talk to and interact with the caching service. Um, so that's, that's a nice feature. We also have the ability to change the cache size. And so this is really key where you may not know how large of a cache you need uh, and you may need to define or you may need to change that cache. You, so you can change the cache size up to once a day and go from like let's say 128 to 256 or back from 256 to 128. And what's nice is when you make this change, it doesn't evict all the data that's in the cache. It allows you to um, change the cache size and preserve the data that's in the cache. So that's another aspect of having this as a managed service that's very nice. Um, and so what I'm going to show here is um, how, to, how to update the application to use the caching service. Um, there's an SDK that you can download and install. I already have it installed. And then once you have that SDK, you can add references to your project, the assemblies that you need to interact with the service, and then update your config file. Uh, one thing that's nice is there's also a NuGet package for this. Um, so I can right click and add uh, reference and search under Windows Azure again. And this time I'm going to grab the Windows Azure dat caching NuGet. And when I install this, it's going to add all the assemblies needed, and it's also going to update the web.config file to have the configuration settings needed. So if I slide down to the bottom, you'll see that it's added this data cache client section, and it's just left a couple of placeholders for my cache name and my cache token. So my cache name, let's see if this, let's refresh to see if this one's created. I'd like to use the, the one I just created if possible. All right, so I'm just going to use the caching demo. So we'll use caching demo, and then this actually makes it easier because I've got a snippet for the token as well. Um, 
caching token. And that caching token is just a base64 um, string that includes some information in it, including the underlying cache name that represents my cache that, that I created, along with an access control service token that authorizes me to uh, connect to and talk to the caching endpoint. Um, and so with that, I've, I've configured everything needed. Um, now what I can do is um, start leveraging it within my application. So very quickly, I'm going to try to update um, my home controller so that on the main page, uh, I list out product information. And so let's see if I can do this quickly. So I've got, here's my uh, Northwind context, reference my model, and then here I've got the ability to um, get the products and then return them. Now in order to do this, I also need to reference system.data and system.data.entity. All right, make sure that that builds. All right, and then let's update the view. And also, oops, oops. And then basically, what this does now is points to the model, and it'll display that information on the page. So let me just make sure that this is running. Go ahead and hit F5. And what we should see is all the products listed on the page. Now, what I want to point out is that when it runs, every time I load that page, it's going to be hitting the SQL Azure database. Now, these product data is reference type data that doesn't change that much. And so I want to leverage the caching service uh, and use a cache aside pattern so that if this product information exists in the cache, just return it from the cache. If it doesn't exist in the cache, get it from SQL Azure, put it in the cache, and then return it. And so I can update this pretty quickly. What I'm going to do is create a private static data cache factory that uses the caching assembly and create a new instance oh, data cache factory. And then here what I'm going to do is Make a couple of quick changes. So F2. So I'm going to create products. Oops, first, let's create a data cache. And the data cache is created off the data cache factory. And it's, we'll say, get default cache. And then I'm going to say, um, I'm going to create a list a product called products, and I'm going to set that equal to the data cache dot get products as a list products or product. And so then I can say if products isn't aren't or if it isn't null, go ahead and return product. And so essentially, that just means, hey, if the data exists in the cache, just grab it from the cache and return it. And that's nice because it's in memory, it's fast, it doesn't have to hit SQL Azure. If it's not available, then go ahead and come down here and let's query the database. So we can say products equals products qu query dot to list. And then once I get that product information, let's put it in the cache. And then, then it's going to be available. And then we can just go ahead and return that. All right. Hopefully, I did it right. Built? Good. So I'm going to put a breakpoint here and hit F5. And so the very first time we walk through it, when it grabs it out of the cache, it should be empty. I haven't put anything in there in a while. And uh, so it's going to. We'll step through this, and we should expect to see that the product information will not be loaded out of the cache. And so we'll step through. So the product data is null. So it's going to come down here, grab it out of SQL Azure, and then we're going to put it into the cache. So we'll return. And then when we refresh the page, now when we come in and grab it out of the cache, 
we'll see that um, there is data. Now, you, you might have noticed a little bit of network latency. That's because in the CTP environment, this cache is running in the US South Central uh, data center. So there's a lot of na network latency between my local laptop and the cache. The, one of the important things to understand is that the cache, uh, since it is a network service, it's best to use it when you've co-located your application with the cache. So presumably what I would do is take this application and deploy it into the US South Central data, data center, and then I wouldn't have that network latency. Um, but you can see here is a very quick demonstration of using that caching service. All right. So let's wrap through a couple of other things. Um, in terms of additional data services, we have SQL Azure reporting, which gives you the ability to create reports and run it as, uh, within C uh, SQL Azure. This is very much like SSRS, or SQL Server Reporting Services, but again, it's a managed service. Um, you can build your, application or your reports using existing tools in the same way. We also have a data sync service, which allows you to synchronize your databases between SQL Azure uh, database servers, as well as synchronize a SQL Azure database to a SQL Server database. And then we also have Windows Azure Data Market, which, if you remember, code name Dallas, it is a data store for you as a developer to tap into a very large number of data sets that you can use within your application. Um, one of the services we just also announced recently is the Global Traffic Manager, and essentially what that is is it's load balancing across data centers. So you can deploy your application in the uh, North American continent, the European continent, and the Asian con uh, continent, and um, have your users routed to the closest data center based on DNS. So this is a great way to, to load balance across data centers. You can use this for performance, so making sure that users are going to the closest data center. You can do it for fault tolerance so that if, let's say, a whole data center you know, went down, uh, you could route all of that traffic to a different data center. And you could even do things like defining a round-robin policy so that it just routed and you know, sent traffic um, based on a, a round robin, just a fixed ratio. What's nice about that fixed ratio concept is, let's say you wanted to try out an, a new version of your application on a small group of users. You could say, send 95% of my users to my application running in um, this data center, but send 5% to a different version of my application and test to see how that works. You could try out a new version of your app. You could uh, test out different ideas and concepts without taking down the existing application that's servicing up most of your users. And then you can all do this all through the portal. Um, quickly, we'll end. Um, Basically, we've got some new types of ways to get started with the platform. On the left, you'll see Windows Azure Pass. This is a free 30-day access to the platform uh, that you can use without having to use a credit card. So this is a nice way to just very quickly get access to the platform and try it. You can see these are the resources that are provided. And to get started, you just go to windowsazurepass.com, and you enter a code. So you can enter the code CloudCover. Um, there's a lot of promo codes. Um, so you enter that code, and then within a day or two, you'll get access to the platform for, for 30 days. On the right, we've got uh, a trial um, that's available through September 30th that uh, provides these types of, of, of uh, resources uh, that you can leverage. Um, so a lot of compute, storage, data transfer, and database. And then we also made some updates to MSDN benefits. So if you're an ultimate or premium subscriber, you'll see that you have more resources available to you. Uh, I think pretty much twice the number of compute hours, um, more storage space, more transactions, bandwidth, and database. And what's also nice is if you're a professional subscriber, you also now get a uh, set of resources available as well. And so you can use these MSDN benefits um, to get this number of uh, free hours, storage, et cetera, um, per month. So this is all monthly, so 750 hours per month of compute with professional. There's a lot of resources that you can, you can go to as well to get started. Um, one of the ones that I highly recommend you look at is the Windows Azure Platform Training Kit. Uh, this is a resource our team creates. We just published some updates in April that includes hands-on labs for the Global Traffic Manager, um, updates for the Access Control Service 2.0, and uh, I think also a SQL Azure reporting services hand-on lab. 
Um, at Mix, we released an accelerator for Umbraco. So if you want to run Umbraco websites within Windows Azure, you can take a look at this uh, accelerator. And we also have some other resources. One in particular I wanted to highlight is the Windows Azure Toolkit for Windows Phone 7. So if you're interested in building Windows Phone 7 applications, uh, this toolkit makes it very easy to leverage Windows Azure as part of that, of, of that solution. So you can take a look at that toolkit. And then the last one is BidNow. And BidNow is a sample application that pretty much uses you know, the entire platform in terms of you know, the caching service, access control, storage, database, compute. And it's designed to be a reference application that you can look at uh, to get ideas and kind of best practices of how to leverage the platform. And so take a look at those resources. Um, also, there's some additional resources here as well. Um, so you can activate some benefits uh, through this teeny URL, teenyurl.com, tools for Azure. And then also you can learn how to create your first application through Deploy Azure Application. Um, I talked about some of this, the subscriber benefits. So if you are an MSDN subscriber, definitely take a look at that. And uh, um, looks like there's some additional resources here for uh, uh, those of you specifically here in uh, Belgium. And it uh, looks like this session will be made available on Channel 9. So if you want to uh, refer to it, uh, you can, you can uh, play it back from Channel 9. And with that, uh, I'd like to say thank you. Uh, hope, hope this gave you a good overview. We went through a lot of stuff very quickly. Um, but I wanted to give you a, an opportunity to get a, a taste for all the different pieces of the platform. And uh, I'm not sure how much time we have left. None. We have no time left. So if any of you have questions, feel free to come down, and I'd be happy to answer them. So thank you very much.